There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. And here I am with another chat with one of Western Canada's most irreplaceable writers. David oh, thank you. David Carpenter, a, a former prof of mine, and we have been doing a series of interviews. This is the third one on his writing. And we're both in Saskatoon. Why do we stay here? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> it's been so cold. And we're here today to talk about his 1994 essay collection writing home. And I have to say, Dave, that I, I'm not a big essay reader, but I have read lots of essays. And this is the best essay collection I've ever read. I just absolutely loved it. It meant so much to me personally. Wonderfully I, I wish I had read it back in the day. Maybe I never would have left Saskatoon because there was so much about Western Canada and Saskatoon in this book that really fired my imagination, so I'm really excited for the chance to talk to you about it. Oh, okay, that's nice to hear. I thought we'd get started by talking about some people that you acknowledge in the acknowledgements, because I'm sure there's some great stories attached to these names. The first one is Mort Ross. Tell us about him. Yes, a long time ago, in the late 60s, early 70s, for my sins, I was a graduate student of English, and I didn't you get my... Both. Oh, that's right. We've <laughs> suffered in the same, same holes. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, I, I was finishing my PhD by the time I started thinking about these essays, and Mort Ross was my supervisor. There were two other people who were also my supervisor, and, and they were extremely helpful. But they kept on going on sabbaticals, and, and then somebody else would take me over. So I had sort of three father figures and Mort Ross was a wonderful supervisor. He taught me the difference between the safety of writing within the jargon of my profession and the more perilous fact of saying just exactly what I meant in my own voice. And I suppose in my thesis, I tried as much as I could to speak in my own voice. But of course, you can't write a, a, a thesis without drawing in a certain level of jargon. And this is the University of Manitoba? No, this is the University of Alberta. Alberta. Yeah. And Mort was a, an American literature specialist, but he, he was very well read in, in Canadian literature. He used to hold court in the faculty club, and he really did hold court. He loved his beers, and he, ha and he had a, a beard like that he was always stroking, and you could see the wisdom coming off his aspect. <laughs> Anyway, he was one of the professors in that department who really gave himself over to his students in a very generous way. And I, I wish I were living in the same city as, as he, because if I were, I would have seen lots more of him after I graduated. And then how about Barbara Moon? Oh, a real sweetheart and, and, and very bright and a, a terrific editor. She took me under her wing with Saturday night for... Uh, I'm thinking several years during which I had sent them a, a lot of short fiction and, and, and non-fiction. Before they were published, she was probably the one who read them first and, and became uh, probably an advocate for those pieces. It was a nice stretch. She had terrific energy and terrific charm, and she was a great reader. But she passed away just a few years after that phase in my life. I never knew what happened to her because she was in Toronto and I was out here. For people that are young or not Canadian, Saturday Night was for about 50 years, maybe? Long-running magazine. Yeah, it ran right up until about... Eight, 1980? A little maybe. beyond that. A little that. beyond that. Yeah. It was the Canadian magazine for many, many years. Absolutely. I thought of it myself as Canada's New Yorker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly. of that caliber. Exactly right. Yeah. So you were in there, so that says a lot. That speaks very highly of your well, writing. It was a very nice beginning to my writing uh, career, absolutely. I have to say. Absolutely. Yeah. Next is Brian Crick. Brian Crick. I was a postdoc at the University of Manitoba when I started doing La Forêt, translating it into English, and so was Brian Crick, and he was a, a Victorian specialist. I guess a Victorian novel was one of his specialties. And Brian was a real maverick, unapologetic about being a real maverick. He was a self-styled 
scholar, critic, teacher, and around the time that I got my job at U of S, he got a job in in Ontario. Gosh, I've forgotten the university. One of the things he said to me when we were we were out in the country with his kids and they were fishing in this little river. And he said, you know, if you really get into the scholarship, <laughs> I don't know why he said if, but I think he, he knew what he was talking about. Because mm -hmm. th then I was sort of thinking about writing instead of scholarship. And, and he says, if you get into it, just write in your own voice as, uh, and, and just make as few concessions to academic formulations as you can. He saw in me a possible maverick, maybe. And I get into this later on in the in the in the book, but um, although I haven't seen him since about 1976 or 77, I've just gotten word from him that he's retired in Ontario. And that's that. But he gave me some good advice. I think this is a great way to begin because the things that these people, the gifts they gave you, the influence they had on you, really, you can feel these energies swirling through the essays. The last one is the guy who wrote the foreword, Alberto Manguel. Oh, yes. Yeah. We met at, at Banff. I was doing a course that he gave on nonfiction. And back then, we didn't call it creative nonfiction, a term that I'm not comfortable with. We called it literary nonfiction, I believe. And Alberto was a polymath. He read in several languages. He read his way to fame. It was a little surprise to me that his books are so stimulating. And, and uh, he, I even read one of his novels. It was really good. good. Yeah. And he's edited so many anthologies and yeah. written about three books about yeah. his own library. And... Yeah. He gave himself over to his students, though, in a really generous way. He was a terrific critic. If he didn't like something I wrote, he would just start asking me questions about it. And pretty soon, he would allow me to realize on my own that I'd blown it or, or, or I'd blown some part of it. And so I actually think, even though I was in my early 30s, and you're not supposed to learn much after that, <laughs> uh, he actually taught me stuff that remained with me today. It, Wonderful teacher. Well, that's a great transition. I'd like you to read from the end of your introduction to this collection, because when I read this, I got so moved by it that I was wanted to get up and dance around the room. <clears throat> I was recently told that hypertext is about to take over from books. Not only are the book of the essay and the story as we know them dead, they are about to be replaced by word games on computer in which the reader chooses the sequence of ideas or events in the piece being read. No more linear plot or sequential reading. If you want, you just use your cursor to choose the next thread in a text with many choices. The man who announced this was part of a trio demonstrating the virtues of hypertext to a young, open-mouthed audience of television watchers and a few old farts like myself who admitted to having read books willingly. The three young men who announced this news were conspicuously futuristic. One of them had no last name. I've never had much luck with people who have no last name. Have you? One fellow would speak while the other two waited for their moment in the demonstration. The sequence of speakers was orchestrated with corporate exactitude, and I could not escape the impression that I had been beamed into a science fiction movie. As the first speaker was doing his spiel, the other two waited with an expression of mysterious portent, as though awaiting orders from Jean-Luc Picard. The book is dead, one of them explained. He was the one who still read things. It is dead because... The computerized texts are more interactive. What do you mean interactive, I said. The word felt oddly metallic in my mouth. More intellectually involving, said one of the trio. More non-sequential, said another. More reader-friendly in every way, said the third fellow, the one who read. I asked him, for he was clearly their leader, if he could name a book he had enjoyed recently. He mentioned several Victorian novels, and did he find these books interactive, I asked. Well, he said, I suppose so. 
I should hope so. For when at last we were treated to a couple of classics of hypertext, I tried very hard to interact. I felt like a retired and overweight bishop trying to learn the twist. The process was about as stimulating as reading the owner's manual to a particularly challenging can opener. It was worse than art gallery prose. Book talk needs to be liberated from the Bastille of experts, where too often it languishes in a prison of pseudo-scientific jargon. Book talk needs to be restored to the common reader, or, if you like, those neighborhood intellectuals who read omnivorously and who just can't wait to get into a good discussion over the latest book they've read. Their need to discuss books is so great they will form reading circles and book clubs to get the job done. A nation without these zealots is an impoverished place indeed. Long live the plain style. Long live its flamboyant cousin, the Baroque flourish. Long live the sentence and all its sparkling possibilities. Long live clarity. Long live the act of weighing, driving out, examining. Long live all the neighborhood intellectuals who drink coffee at the Broadway Cafe in Saskatoon and its sister oases throughout the country. Down with jargon. Down with privileged language spoken to and by specialists who fear clarity. Down with the stifling safety of a specialized vocabulary for those who would speak only to the converted. Down with creative nonfiction. Let us leave hypertext word games to those post-literate futuroids who can afford them. Up with the essay in all its diverse colors. Confusion to our enemies. God, that was a rant, wasn't it? It was just absolutely incredible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I'd read that in about 1995. I was a failed graduate student, and you give voice to so much of what I was struggling with and yeah. what did me in from becoming a professor. Yes. Yeah. I mean, English departments do have a very big function in our world. For one thing, they teach wonderful books. I think at the time, I was getting just so fed up with a trend in modern fiction where instead of writing moral fiction, the great tradition of moral fiction from way before Jane Austen right up to mm. uh, the 1970s, and, and, and out came in the wake of this fad for, uh, I, I call it academic fiction, written by academics, about academics in an academic language where it seems to be life itself was squeezed out in favor of conceptualizing everything. And, and I'm, I'm, I was giving a voice to my exasperation with this kind of fiction when I, when I wrote these words. And I, I think I would change them if I had to write it again, because I, I'm, I'm no longer such a ferocious opponent of, well, conceptualizing. I knew Len Finley very well, and he was a, a, a monster conceptualist. He absolutely was. <laughs> and he taught me a lot of stuff. So I think he's, he's turned me around a little bit. I was interviewed by a wonderful um, CBC book. Can I just go? Oh, of course. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Eleanor Wachtel. I, I'm terrible at remembering names. So Eleanor, please forgive me. I was interviewed by her and she asked me about this rant. And I, I was stymied to defend it. I, I was I was uh, almost embarrassed that I'd written it, even though I still believe most of it. So I, I tried to stumble out a response and realized I, I didn't know why these words bothered me so much. But anyway, there they are. I'm still proud of them. They don't bother me at all. They resonate incredibly deeply. So in many of these essays that are literary criticism, kind of maybe a little more academic in tone, one of the things that you're doing in these essays is defending certain Western Canadian authors from the label regionalist. And in one essay, you argue that they're not bound by the parochial snares of a limited vision. But you say there's some dangers in some of these writers or in some of their works of uh, not escaping from romanticizing the past in their fiction. Can you hold forth on that grand theme of these essays? Yeah, I think that 
I had to distinguish between merely regional and vigorously regional. Mm. I'd been thinking about writers who were somehow circumscribed by the smallness of their community and the smallness of their thinking. It was a reactionary writing, I guess it was. But I found even as early as the 1920s, mid-1920s or so, there were signs of life. And I thought Martha Ostenso was one of those great signs of life. Yes. Uh, she, her characters were, were very believable, and yet they were kind of like walking mythic creatures at the same time. And she was unafraid to talk about erotic love, for example. A thing that I think made Frederick Philip Gould blush I found out that he hated her writing, and I wrote an article called, I think, Petrified Mummies and Mummified Daddies. Yeah. And I, uh, I, that was my way of arguing for a certain kind of writing that reaches the universal through the particulars, that is, the particulars of region, rather than skipping over them and wishing they were from Paris or Rome. Martha Ostenso, I studied in a Western Canadian Lit class taught by Professor David Carpenter back oy, in the oy, 90s. Oy. Yeah. I have since reread it, and it certainly holds up well. She was a Manit based in Manitoba. That's or right. came from Manitoba. I think by the time she wrote it, she was living in the States. She did spend quite a lot of time in the latter half of her career in the States, but I think she rose to fame and to her powers, if you can put it that way, in Winnipeg in the mid-1920s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, has she written anything else worth reading, by the way? Well, I have a terrible memory for titles, as I have for names. But yes, the answer is yes. She sets some of her uh, mid-career novels in the Midwest, in the American Midwest. And I, uh, I thought a lot of them were really good. That's good to know. Yeah. You've already mentioned uh, her in the connection with Frederick Philip Grove. And you have a really great essay. It might have been this theme might have even been developed over a couple of essays in the collection of how those two writers wrote female characters. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yeah, yeah. It seemed that in the first half of the 20th century, fiction writing in Canada and well beyond was a kind of male profession, and there weren't many prominent female writers encouraged or even present in our, in our canon. So when Sinclair Ross came along and wrote about a man from the point of view of a woman, in fact, uh, here's a gay man, started out in, in rural Saskatchewan. Uh, the great influence on his life was his mother. So it's like he, he took on the persona of his mother to write about a man. That's right. Uh, the wife of, of uh, Mrs. Bentley, Philip Bentley. That was a really intimate portrait of a woman kind of isolated on the prairies and very desolate in a desolate marriage at a desolate time in the, the Great Depression. And we should say that novel is As For Me and My House. Right, in 1941. Yeah. But before that, Georges Bunier wrote a, a book called The Forest, uh, La Forêt. And we're going to talk in detail about that in the yeah. next chat. But and yeah. he, he too centered his story about seven or eight years earlier, on a woman, and, and he brings her to life yes. in startling kinds of ways. He sure does. I'm reading it right now. Yeah. But Frederick Philip Grove, not so much. Yeah, I, I like Settlers of the Marsh because he, he tries to write about life in its rawest forms. And some of the women in that novel, I can remember, at least two of them, are nicely fleshed out. But after that, he turned into a disapproving kind of patriarch. And anything to do with intimacy, I think, made him blush. And so in a number of his books, the women were only seen through the eyes of men who disapproved of them. A wife who, who grows fat, for instance, that's all he saw. And uh, I, I think I was pretty disappointed in, in the middle career of yeah, growth. And I remember from taking your class that his own biography is so fascinating. Can you give us a little potted summary of who he was and all the various shades of his well, fake identity and all that yeah. stuff? Oh, my God, uh, it's such a story. A fellow named Felix Paul Greve from Hamburg, I believe, 
who was the son of a streetcar conductor, I think it was. Okay. It was a, a, one of the, the Northern European literati, and his life wasn't going well. I think he was fleeing at least one lawsuit from, from a bigamy charge or something like that, a scandal. And so he hopped on a steamer and headed for the New World. And halfway across, he reinvented himself as a Swedish aristocrat, Frederick Philip Rowe. So he was, he was his his life, in his own autobiography, has is still hidden. The first third of his life is still hidden because he doesn't want to be discovered. I, I think there's legal legal ramifications that he was uh, wary about. But he wrote over Prairie Trails a series of personal essays about living on the prairie with his his new wife and and it it was a wonderful book i'd never thought of writing a bunch of essays about a guy in a cutter behind a horse going to and from work in the middle of the bald prairie but he really made that live huh. and then seth was a marsh that was his his attempt to be dostoevsky i think and and i quite liked it but i, I think he, he went into decline after that but david carpenter is your real name i, I yeah Oh, damn. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. Well, I was really, uh, I'm very grateful to have been introduced to Frederick Philip Grove by you because I enjoyed, I think it was Fruits of the Earth that we studied in your class. I want to spend most of the rest of our time talking about my two favorite essays in this collection. And the first one is available on your website as well. So people can get it that way relatively easily. And it's called What We Talk About When We Talk About Carver. And I would like you to just tell us about this essay, tell us the whole story or part of the story, whatever you want to say about it. It was an absolutely incredible piece of writing. Yes, you know, thank you. It traveled well after I sent it off. It's, it was anthologized and re-anthologized. And I think it began when I was living in Toronto in the early 1980s and writing, and somebody told me, you got to read this Carver guy. And so I started reading this Carver guy, and it was so good. It was so good. This was when he'd stopped being a minimalist, and he was writing quite long stories, yeah. uh, perhaps more complex, more humane, striking a deeper note. Uh, but still, they were about people who were the working poor, who tried to live the American dream and it wasn't working for them, filled with, with heartache and drunkenness. And yet, there was a, a kind of warm, humane center to, to all of those stories. So I thought, God, I would sure like to meet this guy. I was just writing my own fiction at the time, and he, he seemed to know things about writing fiction that I could learn more about. One of the great stories was in what we talk about when we talk about love, a story of a, a young couple trying to pick up some furniture for their new place because they were moving in together. And it was a rainy day in some Oregon or Washington city, maybe Seattle or something like that. And they, they come across a drunken man who's having a yard sale and all of all of the stuff that he's selling is getting soaking wet in the rain, and he's drunk. And the young couple go and talk with him, and not once does Carver mention divorce. Not once does he talk about the reasons why this man is alone when all of his furniture bespeaks an, another partner. But by the end of the story, a very short story, it's like you've lived the, the, this tragedy along with him. And that was his minimalist phase, and then the later phase from Cathedral on. I, I thought, wouldn't it be great if when I go back to Saskatoon and resume my job, we could bring Carver to Saskatoon for a reading? And uh, how, though, how we can't afford his fees. I mean, it, 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 he would ask probably between five and 7000 for reading. And, and the University of Saskatchewan didn't have that kind of money for, a, for a, an American writer. And so I read a story of him about a young couple who had a baby with the colic. And, and it, the baby was very sick. And the, the mother, the young mother, prevailed upon her husband, please don't go out hunting today. Uh, I, I might need you. You might have to take the baby to the hospital. And, 
And at the end of the story, in a little sort of aside, we find the couple is then later on divorced, and he wonders if the if the divorce didn't happen when he 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 didn't go hunting that day. And I thought Raymond Carver wants somebody to take him hunting, and that's a, an insane thought, but it turned out to be right. So I wrote his, I knew who his, his agent was, a, a letter and asked her to pass it on to him. Would you like to come out to Saskatchewan? We have no money, but we have terrific goose shooting. I didn't know anything about goose shooting. <laughs> uh, but I had friends around me who knew, a little, or could, they could pretend they knew something about goose shooting. And he said, okay, I, I'm coming. And uh, I was astounded. He, he said, it's okay if I bring a friend. Uh, oh yeah, it's fine, it's just fine, fine. So we arranged for a hotel for him and came to town with Richard Ford. Richard Ford. Now, none of us had heard about Richard Ford back in 85, I think it was, when these, these negotiations were. Yeah, he answered yeah. your letter on January 19th, 1986, it says here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very good. So Richard and Ray and my wife, Honor, and I got together at my house and just sat down and, and we tried to give... Richard and Ray lessons in speaking Canadian <laughs> and they just couldn't get it but but we had a wonderful conversation where we talked half the night we touched on politics and mortality and everything else in the world and I, I felt I'd become friends with these two guys and Honor was just as impressed with these two guys during this long conversation and so the, the deal was that Ray and Richard would give uh, a reading. I think we paid them $160 each. Because <laughs> that was all there was in the kitty. And then they'd give the reading and we'd set off and go hunting. But on that day of the reading, which was a wonderful reading, um, people just were oozing adulation all, all throughout the room. We got into the car, Bob Calder and... Bill Robertson got into the other car, and the four of us set off in the worst storm I had ever seen in Saskatchewan. There was an election going on, and the storm was so bad that you could find NDP posters on the lawns of, of the rich and, <laughs> and entitled. <laughs> and and uh, we drove through this awful wind, and uh, Richard was in the back seat, and Ray was in the front seat, and Ray said, uh, uh, Dave, um, uh, that's, that's quite a, a wind out there. Uh, do you get winds like that all the time up here? And I said, no. <laughs> and a little while along, the rain turned to snow. Dave, uh, I, I, I see some snow out there. Do you get snow this early in the fall? I said, no. Uh, Dave, oh. Uh, well, I haven't seen any geese yet. You have lots of geese in Saskatchewan. <laughs> I says, where we're going, if we get there, yeah, there's supposed to be lots of geese. And then I kind of broke down. I said, Ray, I was afraid, you see, I'd set American-Canadian literary relations back 20 years just by this hunting trip. Yeah, so I said, Ray, I don't even know if, if we can make it to the place we're going. There's some guys there who will show us you know, where to go and that sort of stuff, but... I, I can't imagine we could drive any side road, so I don't even know if... And, and they saw that I was really nervous. Uh, uh, and Ray was smoking something other than cigarettes. And Ray says, Dave, this is the greatest advice I could have received. He said, Dave, relax. We're on an adventure here. If I just see three or four geese in the whole weekend, I'll be satisfied. Oh, wouldn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, they didn't mean it, but they said it. So we joined another friend of mine named Peter Nash, who was a really good hunter, and he could kind of show us what and what not to do, like why not to point our shotguns at each other. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> so the, the bunch of us went to Scepter, Saskatchewan, uh, got rooms in a motel, and prepared for the next day's hunt. And the weather was just dangerously awful. In fact, Ray Carver couldn't manage to walk through the gumbo. It was so thick. You'd, you'd pick your foot up from the gumbo and you'd have 
five pounds of mud on on your boots. So he he had to miss out on the hunting in the first day, and he was I think he was kind of heartbroken. Mm -hmm. But the second day, the sun started to shine, and I found a road that was so well graveled that we could get to where the geese were crossing. And and then Ray, she was just the walking wounded, heading for death on the first day. The second day, he was a very youthful man, just prancing over the fields, uh, picking up his geese. And although I don't hunt anymore, I don't even approve of it anymore. I wrote a book yes. of disapproval called A Hunter's Confession. That day, we were all very youthful hunting guys, and we had a, a wonderful time. And when Ray got on the, on the airport, leaving for his plane, he kind of begged me, can we do this again? And we were supposed to do it the next year, but that's when the cancer started taking over. So Richard and I went hunting, but, but Ray couldn't make it, and he never got back to Saskatchewan. Even when he was dying of cancer, in terrible shape, he was saying to Richard, Richard, we're going to go back to Saskatchewan, as they pronounce it, Saskatchewan, and we're going to shoot with Dave. We're going to shoot some geese again, aren't we? And Richard, oh yeah, oh yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the story in, in brief, and the beginning of beautiful short-lasting friendship. That's incredible. And if you think that now you don't need to read the essay because Dave has told you everything, no, he hasn't. There's a, He's only told you half of it. You have to read the essay. It's just a wonderful essay. Read the essay. Read the essay. Read the essay. And the, the last thing I want, that's right. <laughs> the last thing I want to say about, ask you about that is part of the essay is you make some really fascinating connections between Ray, Raymond Carver's plain speaking prose Mm. and Saskatchewan literature. Yeah, I found some of the best work that I ever read in the classes that I taught about Western Canadian fiction was by Sinclair Ross, a skinny book of short stories about desperate lives on the prairies, often during the Depression. Is that The Lamp at Noon? Yeah, The Lamp at Noon and yeah. other stories. That reminded me that people in Saskatchewan were plain speaking. Wherever I went, if I tried to call on my vast experience among the literati and the professoriate, uh, I didn't get too far. I saw people's eyeballs rolling up towards the heavens, waiting for an, an end to this sentence that Carpenter was uttering. You know. <laughs> anyway, I, I came to love uh, the plain style through the writers. I think the natural air I think when Ross is Guy Vanderhaeg, mm -hmm. although his prose is more elaborate, he could get lyrical when he has to. He's a kind of a straight shooter, uh, verbally, um, and and he really nails it in uh, an economic fashion. I remember The Lamp at Noon. We studied it when I took your class, and... I can't remember if the word coronet is in the title, but there's a story about is he a hired man or somebody from the city comes out to the country and he's playing a... Coronet? Coronet? At, at dawn, yeah. A coronet at dawn. Yes. And I thought for the first time in my life, as I didn't know anything about Sinclair Ross other than his writing, this is really homoerotic, the way it's written. I yeah. Thought, Was he gay? I don't think anybody but a gay man could write about a, a young, yeah. handsome man yeah. that way. You're right. You're and and right. then I found out later, and I was like, yes, I've got gaydar even when I'm <laughs> reading literature. <laughs> now, he was born in, what was it, 1908 or something so, like that. So he went through life in Saskatchewan uh, severely closeted, yes. and he only really came out to his gay friends in Spain and his gay friends in Vancouver who yes. visited him in the sort of uh, the hospital that he spent his last years in. I think he was another generation of gay men who right. who somehow managed to be gay and live the gay life without exposing himself to the inevitable uh, homophobia that, that existed then. His partner, I believe his name is Keith Fraser, wrote a kind of tell-all memoir. Did you ever read it? I want to read that. Yeah, I me never too. Had read it. I yeah. haven't read it either. Yeah, I I met Keith Fraser. Uh, gosh, I think it was maybe at a a literary conference in either Banff or Vancouver. In a sense, I've saved the best for last. Although I couldn't choose the best or my favorite, but this this one just blew me away. This essay is called "This Shot," and it opens when I was reading it. I'm get halfway down the first page, and I'm thinking. 
this is fiction. What is this doing in a book of essays? Because there was dialogue and it was about a photographer coming over to a house in Saskatoon to take a photo in 1925. And we meet the three kids, Jenny, Peggy, and Bert. And I'm enjoying it, but I'm thinking, this, this is not an essay. What is this? What is this? And then at the halfway point, everything changes. So that's my little setup. Now, please talk about this essay. It's one of the most incredible things I've read. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you like it. I, I, I love it too. Um, I, I should start by outing my characters. Mm. The three children in that essay are my mother, her sister, Pe Pe yeah, Peggy. 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 Sorry, yeah, yeah. Peggy. And my uncle, Uncle Jim. They lived in a very lively household in Saskatoon. Growing up, uh, let's see, mom was born in 1910, her sister a little before that, her brother a little after that. And they grew up in the house of a fascinating, brilliant, feckless businessman who was my grandfather, Parkin. And grandfather Parkin lived for hunting and fishing. But when it came to business, he just didn't mind the shop properly. And uh, they went bankrupt. And so my grandmother, Granny Parkin, she was, I think her last name was Heron. She was Irish, a Toronto Irish. And her father came out to Saskatoon, wouldn't give her a cent because she knew she'd squander it. And he knew the husband would more than squander it. So he sat with the developer while they built a house for my, my, my mother's family. And, and, and he paid for the house, and, and then he went away. And it was their job to stay as um, financially viable as they could. But that house still stands. Oh, it does. I was yeah, going to ask it's you. It's on, uh, is it 6th Avenue, a uh, block from the river? Okay. On the other side of town. And uh, it, was, it has been turned into a and b uh. So I've been in that house. I got to know Auntie Kay, is her real name, uh, uh, really well. And I got to know my, my uncle really well. My mother was a great dancer and singer, just like Auntie Kay. So when I got my job in Saskatoon in 1975 or six. A fellow named Delisle Thompson was reminiscing on the CBC about his his work as an early broadcaster in Saskatoon. And the one piece of memory he brought up was about my mother, her sister, and and a woman named Vi on the piano. They'd get dressed up to the nines. They'd go down to the studio. No one would see them except for Delisle Thompson, the producer. And they would sing love songs and popular songs and old-fashioned songs. Uh, and my mother said, oh, it was nothing, it was nothing. I wasn't that good. But the only one he could remember in any detail was my mother, who was quite a looker. The family you meet here is the family that uh, I got to know. But, of course, I wasn't there when all this was happening in the first half of the story. So I had to imagine that I was there. I had to imagine what the dialogue would be like. I had to try and capture the Roaring Twenties phenomenon that happened inside the house when the boys came over, uh, a courting and, and visiting. And uh, so I still think it's an essay because I'm, I'm, I'm not deviating hardly at all from the facts of the, of, of, of the story. I agree. And you've done something that I've never seen before, where it starts out where the reader thinks they're reading fiction. And then there's a turn in the second half, it reads like a personal essay. Yeah. And there's at least two facets to your identity as a writer. They're both there, um, and the tension, maybe tension isn't the right word, but the energy between those two parts of your writerly selves yeah. are just there kind of vibrating against each other. It's really quite remarkable. Oh, well, thank you very much. I, I, I'm just going to turn to this essay, uh, this shot, yeah. At the same time, as I was enjoying writing the story, I was also up against the futility of bringing back dead people who had chosen to live in obscurity. And I think that uh, the photographer that I conjured up had a similar frustration when he, he said, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. That's the line, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes I think I've really connected with that family and sometimes I don't because of the distance of years that I was trying to recapture. 
and I wondered if you have has anything that was in there taken other shapes in other writing since then? It's a good question. I know I tried to write a novel with my mother and, and Uncle Jim, Annie Kay, and a fictionalized version of Sinclair Ross, uh, all in the same bookstore. I tried to write a novel that just petered out, and it's one of the few novels I started that I gave up on after chapter four. So I haven't written a lot about that household. And so then my next question would be, is any of your fiction, which we have yet to really talk about in depth, and I'm looking forward to doing that, but so I don't know the answer myself, is your fiction decidedly not autobiographical, or is it a mixture of... Oh, yeah. Um, the, the first uh, novel, length novel, that I wrote was Banjo Lessons, and that's very autobiographical in spirit, but I think the main character had a more interesting upbringing than I did. I think he had more fun, too. So that's, that's, that's quite autobiographical in a lot of things. I really get close again to the city of Edmonton where I grew up. Uh, but most of the fiction I wrote before that and most that I wrote after that, there would be very little of David Carpenter in them. But every story I wrote and every character I wrote, I drew heavily upon um, not only my own reading but my own life in order to, to flesh out a character. It gets kind of, uh, what's the word, transmogrified into fiction. Yeah, 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 yeah. If anybody knew me well and read my short stories, they'd know, oh yeah, yeah, Carpenter knows that part of the North. I knew he, a long time ago, he went up there once, you know. And, That's right. And I brought back memories. Of well, let's go full circle, because I actually had an encounter with Alberto Manguel in mm -hmm. the 1980s, and so that might have been his novel, or one of his novels, he was launching... At Greenwood's Books in Edmonton. You probably knew that store yeah, on yeah. White Avenue. Yes, right. And I went to his the, the reading, and I was young and pretty back then, and he, th I think he <laughs> thought I was quite pretty. But we had a, quite a conversation after the reading, and so, uh, because of what we talked about, I think he was launching a novel. He said that the novel was not at all autobiographical. He said, yeah. I'm not the kind of writer that writes about my own life and turns it into fiction. And I remember I said to him, yeah, that's a different kind of writer. Like, there's almost, like, two kinds of writers. A writer who draws from their own life, and almost everything they write is based on their own life, yeah. and the writers who conjure it up from, that's decidedly not yeah, their own life. Writers. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And maybe you're more that. Well, I certainly tried to be that. When I've written a story that seems, at least on the surface, to be very uncarpentarian, I'm always pleased. <laughs> Dave, it's been a real uh, treat and a real honor to talk about writing home with you. Well, thank you very much again. Thank you. You're a pretty good talker yourself. <laughs> well, thank you. It means a lot coming from you. <laughs>